We now move on to questions to the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development. And again, we start with topical questions. And I call Mr. Fra McCann. Could the Minister give an assessment of the potential for the agri-food sector? Agri-food is one of our most successful industries and is a major driver for um, success in our rural economy. It is our largest manufacturing industry, achieved sales of over $4 billion, and contributed almost $1 billion of added value to the local economy in 2011. It provides around 10 per cent of all private sector employment, and it is also one of the only sectors in the North which has continued to grow in spite of the economic downturn. As Minister, I was delighted that I was able to secure the inclusion of the agri-food as a priority sector within the North's economic strategy and the Executive's commitment to de um, develop and implement a longer-term strategic plan for the sector as part of the programme for government. The Agri-Food Strategy Board has identified opportunities for sustainable growth and it has targeted increased employment in the sector. The Board's report, Going for Growth, contains a vision for growing a sustainable, profitable and integrated agri-food supply chain focused on delivering the needs of the market. So I'm pleased that the report recognises the requirements for all parts of the supply chain to be sustainable and to be profitable. I believe that this is something that we could all aspire to for the industry. Going for Growth has set challenging targets for the agri-food sector by 2020 to create 15,000 new jobs, to grow sales by 60 per cent to 7 billion, to increase sales to the north or outside of the north from, uh, to 4.5 billion and also then to increase value added to 1 billion. There is a lot of work to, to do to meet the challenging targets set by the industry within Going for Growth and industry itself has had a key role to play in developing the plan and will also do so in its delivery. Industry, as I said, has had a key role to play in developing the plan and will also um, take forward a lot of the delivery aspects to it. And I understand that the Board is reconvening the sectoral subgroups to agree the way forward on the industry-led recommendations. So from the Government perspective, I will continue to work closely with my executive colleagues to help support the industry's plans for expansion. Can I again, again remind members in asking topical questions that they should avoid questions that are listed for oral questions? I call Fra McCann. Uh, and I thank the Minister for her question thus far, but I know the Minister has said there's lots to be done, and I know she's brought this to, uh, to executive colleagues. Uh, but what can be done in the meantime uh, to move us along? Yeah, it's absolutely not a case that we're waiting. Um, myself and the Deputy Minister have a piece of work to do in coordinating the response from all the different departments because there are a number of key asks of various departments. The piece of work that we're involved with is, is bringing a paper to the executive which actually charts out what each department is going to do and deliver in the time ahead. However, we're not waiting until that piece of work is done. We um, already have made a number of announcements. One of the key asks in the document was particularly around access to finance for um, industry. And I'm delighted that the agri-food loan scheme has already been announced, and that's going to help farmers and producers um, who are involved in integrated supply chains to be able to access finance. Uh, one other one of the key asks was around um, eradicating TB, and I've announced my intention to establish the new government industry strategic partnership that's going to develop a long-term strategy to eradicate TB. And then also the other area that we're already moving on is in terms of developing the new rural development programme because I have always said that that's going to be a significant tool in terms of um, the department to be able to deliver um, in terms of the asks in the Growing for Growth recommendations. So there's a lot of work that's um, already um, ongoing. I'm recently back from a trip to China where, again, we're out um, engaging with new markets, trying to get our, um, our local produce into those new markets. So there's a lot of work that's ongoing, but I look forward to um, myself and the Deputy Minister bringing the paper to the Executive in the near future where we will um, hopefully secure agreement on the way forward across all government departments. I call Ian McRae. Um, on the 16th of May, the, the Minister um, announced that the Rivers Agency headquarters was moving to um, Cookstown. Can the Minister update the House on what progress has been made on this? Yes, absolutely. Um, the Member will be aware that um, I'm very committed to making sure that we decentralise public sector jobs, that there is a fair distribution, and I'm sure he welcomes the fact that we have um, up to approximately 60 jobs from Rivers Agency going into um, the Mid-Ulster area. Um, that location was chosen for um, many reasons, um, not least because of its central location and Rivers Agency being an emergency responder need to be able to um, reach many areas of the north very speedily. So um, we're working our way through the progress. I've said my intention is that we'll be on site by 2015. So there's been a lot of work done in terms of the, the site at Lockery, which the department owns, and um, where we would access or where we would site the building, the new building or if we could use existing buildings on the site. So that works ongoing, but as I say, the target for 2015 is, is still a very live and real one. I call Ian McRae. 
I, I, I agree with the minister's words that, that, you know, in her announcement that Cookstown is a prime location for this site. But will the minister not accept that there are people who are concerned that when they hear these statements, and whether it be DARD headquarters or indeed Rivers Agency headquarters that are moving out of Belfast, that they would like to see it move as quickly as possible? Can the minister assure me and indeed other colleagues and the other constituencies that, that this is progressing as quickly as possible? Absolutely, as I said at the start, I'm fully committed to making sure that this happens. It is a fair distribution of public sector jobs. So I'm committed to the move um, of Rivers Agency to Cookstown, Fisheries to Down, um, Forestry to Fermanagh, and obviously new headquarters going up into the, the North West. So for me, they're all very, um, th there's a lot of um, work going on. Um, I'm making sure that officials are, um, I suppose, keeping the pressure on the officials to make sure that they're delivering. There's a lot of work to do. It's not something, this is not something you move and turn over. Um, overnight, but um, I can assure the member that progress is being made and we're working our way through the, the, to meet the target time of 2015. I call Fergal McKinney. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for her replies thus far. I'm sure the Minister is acutely aware of the frustrations being felt across many areas of Northern Ireland, and I'm thinking of areas like the Spurns, the Mourns and the Glens over the issue of rural broadband. And what is the Department doing about this problem? Yes, and I, and I share those concerns. It's something that I've repeatedly talked about uh, in this House. Um, and coming from a rural area, I can absolutely understand the difficulties that, that are being posed. And I, I decided that I would insert myself into um, trying to sort out the problem. It's obviously daddy responsibility. However, that being said, if I'm asking farmers and rural communities to apply for things online, I think it's, um, it's only appropriate that I also should then um, try and solve a problem that, that obviously exists. So I've done that in a number of ways. Um, practically in terms of DART direct offices and, uh, and encouraging farmers that don't have access to broadband or even to computers to make sure that they use um, the DART direct offices that are open and um, available for them. But secondly, um, in terms of um, actual financial investment, I have um, did some work with DETI and I'm putting forward five million into the, the DETI project, which is targeting areas that uh, are actually not spots. Um, one of the, the problems in the past, I believe, has been that um, DARD funds in the past haven't necessarily went into the, the, or the areas of need. So on this occasion, I have made sure that I have identified areas based on deprivation statistics on where I believe the five million funding that I am putting forward should be targeted. I call Fergal McKinney. Uh, thank you. And are clear, realisable targets being put in place to achieve 100% coverage, satisfactory coverage? Um, Daddy are involved with, which I am I'm now involved with, um, clearly sets out that by 2015, um, I think it's something like 98.9% .9 of people will be covered. I'm absolutely working to that. I would like to see um, the reason that I have prioritised the areas is based on deprivation. Let's try and get a service into those areas as quickly as possible. So the scheme, um, Daddy had went out to um, tender. I believe that's all been signed off. So um, I know work is going to start immediately. I've identified the areas where I f feel that funding should um, be directed, so I'd like to see um, progress being made almost immediately. I call Mr Jerry Kelly. I noticed that the Minister, I that the minister has uh, approved uh, funding for uh, faith-based groups uh, recently, which is a very good thing. I wonder would the Minister elaborate on um, what she sees as uh, advancing reconciliation in rural areas? In, in my view, um, reconciliation presents one of the biggest challenges for, for each and every one of us. Across some um, rural and urban areas, good progress is obviously being made, but much more needs to be done, for example, in tackling the major issues such as um, segregation. And that applies equally so in the rural setting as it does in the urban setting. In my opinion, in, the t in terms of the past, it may well be that the best we can do is agree to disagree. In other words, accept that there are obviously different narratives um, relating to this. So I think our focus should be primarily on the future, and that should be the objective of any actions in moving forward. I would welcome ideas on how my department can be of assistance in taking that forward, particularly in rural areas. I call Jerry Kelly. Thank you, Minister, for her answer so far. Maybe she could elaborate on some in terms of practical uh, steps where you think that that could be advanced. I think um, one of the, the obvious key elements of reconciliation is, is dialogue, and, and we need to increase the conversations, particularly um, the difficult conversations that need to happen. And as I said, we clearly have different narratives about our past, and um, I think we are going to have to agree to disagree on this. But the past can't be allowed to hold us back for the future. 
We need to deliver for the people that elect us. And reconciliation, as everybody knows, is going to be a long, proce uh, a long process, but good work has already been done and we need to build on that. We need to build on it and, and do a lot more. And if my department can play a role in assisting with that, then I, I'm very much up for that. And as I said, I really would welcome any ideas that people might have on how I can best direct funds and support from my department in taking that forward. Michaela Boyle is not in her place. I call Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister inform the House when and why the decision was taken for Animal Health and Welfare NI to take forward the bovine viral diarrhoea and Johoni schemes and why these aren't being undertaken by our department's veterinary service? Well, it's, it's the um, BVD and also Yoni's disease that's been taken forward with the Animal Health and Welfare Group. It's an excellent piece of work, so um, I'm not sure if the member has concerns about it, but it is an excellent piece of work that was taken forward with John Thompson at the lead of it. Um, that group was established alongside a similar group that was established in the south because obviously the key aim is to get free movement of cattle across this island. We have an all-island animal health and welfare strategy in place and that is going to be, um, I think, the vehicle for delivery and that is going to be the EU animal health law. So we're actively working towards that. There's been very, very positive work done um, with the animal health and welfare group and they'll continue to do that in the time ahead. And I know it's something that the farming community have actually very much welcomed. This is tackling a disease, a production disease. So it's not waiting to something sick, it's actually tackling it head on. So it's obviously going to improve the competitiveness of the farming industry in the time ahead also. I call Joanne Dobson for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for her answer. It's just unusual for her department not to want to take on additional staff and responsibilities. Perhaps the Minister could confirm that this is a new trend for her department of engaging the private sector and inform the House about the procurement procedures she will use in future schemes. Well, I can assure the member that I'm not a control freak. If somebody else can do it better, I'm quite open to them coming forward and, and suggesting that that's the case. And in this case, in this instance, what I've said is this group is the best placed group to be able to take this forward. It's a group that's very similar to the, to the group that's been formed in the south. It is all about free movement of cattle across this island. It is something that's very much welcomed by the, the farming community, and it is tackling production diseases head on. So it's very positive. But as I said, if there are groups out there that can provide services that need to be provided, I very much welcome that. I was a big supporter of this group, which is why I put financial contribution behind the work that they did to get them started. And we also have industry contributions, so it's a win-win all around, I think, for everybody. I call Dolores Kelly. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister, in relation to assisting women in the farming uh, uh, industry, what specific measures is she helping uh, uh, women to remain within the farm? I think that's, that's a, ver a very good question, uh, particularly in relation to um, given the average age of a farming community. We've involved in a lot of work around succession planning, so it's actually going in, talking to families, talking about what's their plans for the future. And that also, in, on every occasion, would also involve um, mothers and sisters and, and others in the house. Um, so I'm very much involved in, in taking that work forward, but also through, um, through a lot of the Access 3 funding, through a lot of the, the rural development funding, we've had um, a lot of rural businesswomen being able to bid into the programme and being successful um, for, for their projects, so that's all very successful. I also attend a number of rural women's um, network events so we can um, talk to rural women about what are their needs and then shaping the supports from the department. There are quite a wide range number of, of issues and initiatives that, are, initiatives that have been taken forward and I'm happy to provide it to, to the member if I haven't covered them all uh, in, in the answer. I call Dolores Kelly for supplementary. I would be grateful to the Minister to actually provide me with more detail around the specific measures. But in, in terms then of widening out uh, those measures, in terms of then rural poverty, uh, what analysis has the Minister's Department made in relation to the impact of poverty on women and any uh, detriment then it is to them to go into the farming industry? Yep, and, and as part, the member will be very aware, um, given our time on, on the committee, that um, I had taken forward a £16 million package for tackling poverty and isolation. And quite a lot of work was done there around how do we target those most in need. That includes women. So in all that analysis, um, women were part of that. And we did take forward some um, fantastic projects. And I know £16 million doesn't sound like a lot on the scheme of things. However, it was leverage funding. We were able to put forward some money that attracted other departments then to, to match fund or, or um, do projects that they necessarily wouldn't have done um, in the absence of, of the £16 million funding. So there's been lots of positive work and, and also 
In terms of childcare, I know the member has an interest in childcare. With the Bright Starts initiative that has been announced last week, there are a number of um, specific um, rural measures in terms of childcare, that I'm, which I am um, committed to taking forward, three in total. And that is around you know, social economy enterprises in terms of childcare. It is around creating additional places, and it is around practical physical support also. So there is lots of um, positive work in terms of rural women um, being taken forward in this department. And that is the end of the period of topical questions. And we move on now to oral questions that have been listed for the Minister to answer. Question number three has been withdrawn. And I call Mr. Fergal McKinney. Question number one, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The disease whose scientific name is um, P. Remorum, uh, well, Phytophthora P. Remorum, I'm going to call it P. Remorum from, from the rest of the answers. It's a series threat to over 100 um, species of plants. This includes our native ash trees and bilberry. In 2010, we discovered that Japanese larch produces infective spores in large quantities in the crown of the, uh, of the tree. Our strategy has been to fail both infected larch trees and those apparently healthy trees around infected sites because the disease may be present but not showing symptoms and because infected larch forests have the capacity to spread the disease widely. Since the first diagnosis of P. remorum in larch in August 2010, over 600 hectares of woodland have been failed. Despite this, recent surveys found that the disease is continuing to spread within areas infected in previous years on the, in the Antrim Plateau in County Down and South Armagh. We also found new scattered infections in Tyrone and Fermanagh, and Forest Service plans to clear an additional 360 hectares as soon as possible. Once the disease is well established in the woodland environment, it is impossible to eradicate, and as this is the case in southwest Scotland and parts of Wales, we are close to that point in the north of Ireland. Therefore, I have instructed officials to re-evaluate our policy options to contain the disease in the north, to protect the most vulnerable areas and to promote forest um, recovery. We are setting priorities for forests where the disease appears to be localised, where there are important uh, botanical collections and where natural environment sites would benefit from the felling of trees. We are working closely with the forest industry to get this work done in an orderly manner as quickly as possible. In the meantime, visitors are welcome to our forests our forests remain open, but I would stress the importance of following the biosecurity guidance for everybody that uses um, our forest service land. I call Fergal McKinney. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the, the Minister for the detailed response? Uh, clearly, that is of a major concern. And can I ask the Minister, uh, has her department been in communication with DEFRA in London uh, regarding this matter? And what procedures are they putting in place in relation to the threat of the disease, given the extent which she is now reflected on of the problem? Well, obviously, my priority is what is happening here, but of course, I engage with DEFRA um, and also with Dan from the South. Um, we have in place our all island strategy um, in terms of plant health, and we very much engage that when it comes to these tree diseases. But we obviously um, have conversation on an ongoing basis with DEFRA on many issues, and this, this certainly is one of those, given the fact that this is a disease that is right across um, Ireland, it is in Britain, right across Europe. It's a, it's a, uh, and, and diseases right across the board. So we have ongoing discussions. We um, particularly try to learn from each other in science. We have a lot of great work being done in AFBI, but um, that's our science institute here. But um, we also learn to see what, what other areas are doing and, and make sure that we assist each other in terms of tackling these diseases that obviously see us felling large amounts of, of timber right across the north, which is not something that anybody wants to, wants to see. I call Cahill Boylan. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister. But just could the Minister outline what actions she's actually taken with her southern counterparts to tackle this disease? Yeah, yes, as I said, we have in place the All Island Animal Health and, and or Animal Health, the All Island Plant Health Strategy, which um, means that we work collectively across the island and, and it it gives us tremendous benefits in terms of um, a fortress iron approach whenever we do have disease because obviously something that happens in, in Donegal and forests is, is going to have a, an impact on in dairy and forests. So it makes uh, logical sense that we cooperate. As it, and as I said in the previous answer, we cooperate with DEFRA and with DAMF. But in terms of um, particular action with the South, um, forest services um, in the North and the South exchange information about um, this disease on a regular basis and they met as recently as um, mid-October. So they basically meet at least once a month in terms of tackling plant health disease. In, 
Um, but I'm re-evaluating the policy options that we're going to take uh, to take into account this, the extent in which we can contain the disease and, and protect ourselves. So AFPI, which is the Science Institute, is collaborating with um, the Council for Forest Research and Development on the Remoran project, which is partners at Cheswick and also the Universities of Limerick and also in Dublin. And the topic um, also to say that the North South Ministerial Council meeting has this as a regular topic for discussion and um, we, we, we actually have this table for a further discussion at the next sectoral meeting. I call Leslie Cree for a supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I would, would thank the Minister for his, her response to this, which obviously is a very serious issue. Minister, can you assure us that the many criticisms that were found with your department's handling of the Shalara infections have been rectified and will not be repeated in the fight against this particular disease? Well, if the members are referring to um, the recent committee, the DARD committee inquiry into Clara, I actually really welcome that as a constructive um, debate and constructive engagement in terms of what else we can be doing. Um, the, the, in terms of tackling this disease in, in large, it's really been around containment and eradication. It's been um, taking that right down to site levels to try and isolate outbreaks of the disease and making sure that it doesn't um, spread any further. But despite the, the surveillance and the management, uh, of, and we have seen a recent expansion of the disease, and that indicates that it's becoming a bit more well established in, in um, the wider woodland. So, as I said earlier, I have actually asked officials to go back to take a look at this again, to look at the policy, to look at um, are we making sure that we're doing everything practically possible. We have um, also put more resources into the, uh, the forestry section to be able to, to deal with all of this, so, um, and that is something that actually the committee were, were calling for. So there has been a lot of positive work going on, but this disease is something that is spreading. We have to, obviously, in, in the first instance, look at eradication and, and containment, but as things move on, then uh, you, you, you have to take a step back and take a look at your policy again, which is what I am involved in doing um, at this moment in time. And I call Ross Hussey. Question to you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Going for Growth was developed by the Agri Food Strategy Board as part of the Executive's programme for Government. The industry, through the Board, has identified opportunities for sustainable growth and targeted increased employment in these sectors. And this is something that we all hope for. Going for Growth is currently being considered by government departments, by agencies, and the Board itself to identify the best way forward to take forward its numerous and wide ranging recommendations. The recommendations made by the Board are directed at both government and, and um, also at industry, and the investment at, at the Board is identified from both, um, both of us is going to be significant. From a government perspective, departments are exploring the various mechanisms that could provide funding to support sustainable growth in the sector, including the new Rural Development Programme and the European Regional Development Fund, as well as Invest NI Selective Financial Assist Assistance Programme. In the current economic climate, impl implementation of some of the recommendations is going to be very challenging for the Executive, and we will need to look carefully at the resource implications of all the proposals. The recently announced Agri-Food Loan Scheme will help producers involved in integrated supply chains to access finance that they uh, need to expand production in a sustainable way. Access to finance was one of the key areas that was highlighted in the Going for Growth, and this will help provide a solution to that key challenge. As I said, we plan to seek an executive endorsement of the proposed way forward in response to the Board's report in the very near future. I call Ross Hussey. Thank you, the Minister, for her response thus far. Whilst the Minister and her department may claim that good progress is being made on the plans for implementation of a range of recommendations until Dard and Delhi decide on the final finances required, as well as when, where they will be coming from, including the agri-food agri loan scheme, Will this, which will be small in comparison, can't you tell us whether successful implementation of the strategic action plan is entirely dependent on the £400 million previously stated? I have previously said to this House that I do believe that whilst I accept these are challenging targets, I do believe that they are doable. And the reason I say that, even before myself and the Deputy Minister have taken a report and action plan to the Executive, we have delivered on some of the key major asks, particularly around access to finance, because that was one of the key um, asked in the document. That was one of the areas where businesses are constantly saying to us that they can't get access to finance. So the agri-food loan scheme was us progressing that, even in absence of us um, being to the executive yet. So that's something that I know is very much welcomed by industry. It's particularly targeted at the poultry industry at this moment in time. However, it's going to follow our sector, sorry, and in the future it's going to um, target the other sectors, so moving into dairy and, and the meat sector um, and, and pork sectors uh, over the next number of months. So that's very positive. 
We also have, as I said, the TB strategy, which I have launched. That's taken a strategic look at TB because that's something that has a major impact on our farming practices here. And that's, as I said, all very positive work that's being done, even outside of um, the, the work going forward to the executive. And the other area then is the rural development programme. I have used the report from the agri-food strategy to sort of shape the, the proposals that are going out for, excuse me, going out for consultation from the rural development programme. So that, that's all very positive work that's ongoing even before we go to the executive with the other proposals that um, we've asked for. So there is great work going on. I actually was at an industry event last week and the industry are very positive about what the executive are doing in terms of agri-food. They're very positive that it's in the programme for government. They're very positive that the executive are responding to their needs. So great pieces of work being done. A lot more to do, absolutely. Challenging, absolutely. But doable, absolutely. I call Paul Frew. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And of course, we, we know that the departments are assessing the, the agri-food strategy report at the present time. And we're also seeing some of the recommendations seeping out into the psyche of departments. But can I ask the Minister, are there any of the over 100 recommendations, are there any that she now, now, now knows that she will not implement and she does not support? No, I've, I've kept a very open mind and we've asked departments to approach it in that way. So um, myself and the Deputy Minister will be meeting over the, next, uh, over the next number of weeks, I think it is, to actually home in and see where, where we can uh, bring forward the, the actual implementation plan. So there's nothing that jumps out to me that's an absolute uh, non-runner at this stage. But again, um, what we've done is, as I said, we've asked, the, as part of the Rural Development Consultation, asked people to be mindful of the fact that we had that, the Going for Growth document. And we kind of shaped it in a, in a sense that gives us that sort of feedback. So there's nothing that jumps out at me as, as, as a non-runner at this stage. Um, what, Will we be able to provide everything? Will industry provide everything? That will be the question further down the line. But I think if we go into it with a positive frame of mind, with a positive attitude, then I think that we'll come out with, it with, a, with a whole lot more. I call Joe Byrne. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for her answer on this question so far. Given that finance will be required in order to implement going for growth as part of the agri food strategy report, what discussions has the Department had with banks and how successful or otherwise have those discussions, given that it's going to be important that banking finance is available for farming? As I said earlier in, in previous answers, um, we now have launched the Agri-Food Loan Scheme. So that was as a result of um, correspondence with Detty and banks, and they signed a mem uh, memorandum of understanding with all the major banks who are now going to have a real focus. There's going to be executive um, backup of about 40% of, of the finance. So that is, is something that, that's going to make a real difference to, to those people that are um, asking banks for, for funding. The member will be very aware in his role uh, in the committee that this is one of the big issues that is facing anybody that has um, vision and wants to be able to do something is actually getting access to finance to be able to do it. So the agri-food loan scheme has already been rolled out. It's um, targeted obviously at poultry, but um, it's by, I think by December time, early January, it'll be um, pork and um, moving on then to meat and dairy in the future. So um, to me, it's looking after all the sectors. It's identifying a major problem and it's the executive sort of, um, I suppose, responding to that problem and telling industry, here's how we're prepared to help you. And it's actually by putting that physical capital there and by negotiating that with the banks. Question three has been withdrawn. I call Trevor Lunn. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. That's question four. Council Directive 1999-74-EC was adopted in 1999 and lays down minimum welfare standards for the protection of laying hens. The directive was transposed into domestic legislation here by the Welfare of Farmed Animals Regulations 2012. Since the 1st of January 2012, it's been illegal to keep laying hens in conventional or battery cages. I'm pleased to, support, or to report that all of our producers are compliant with that directive. Um, I acknowledge the commitment that our egg industry has shown, and many of our producers made a big investment in converting to other production systems, that which demonstrated their commitment to animal welfare and also the reputation of the egg industry here. I call Trevor Long. Yes, uh, I thank the Minister for that answer. I'm not surprised that our producers complied because that's the type of people they are. Uh, the, the question was more directed perhaps at the Europe-wide reaction, and uh, if you remember the debate, Minister, back in 2012, when it was some doubt was cast on the ability of other countries to actually comply with this directive. Can, can you confirm whether uh, we are importing eggs into this country now, which are being illegally produced in other countries? 
I confirm for the member that it's uh, Germany and Italy who are the two member states that are still not compliant. There were 11 others, but when um, legal action was taken against them, they very quickly became compliant. Um, so we have the two, two, Italy and Germany, that are still not compliant. We can't stop um, the free movement, obviously, of table legs, so we can't stop the, the, the movement in. However, I can say that in the past six months, inspectors haven't en encountered any consignments from um, any of the two member states that are, that are um, non-compliant. Um, in the past, whenever we have encountered um, eggs coming from there, origin details of, of those consignments were checked against the member states' list. So, if you remember, member states had to produce lists of who was compliant and who wasn't. So, our people were able then to check if these eggs were coming from either a compliant or non-compliant producer, and then we were able to then say, well, they're not going to be marketed as Class A eggs. So, we were able to put some control on that. I think the other issue, which is the key issue, is around egg product coming in, and I think we had that discussion in the debate around how do you um, stop or at least um, hinder eggs coming in from either Germany or Italy in products such as, it could be anything from lasagna till powdered, anything at all. So um, that's one of the areas that the, the department has been um, making sure that we're also identifying products and then referring those back also. So it's not just the eggs, it's also the egg products that we're focusing on. I call Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. Mr London, the debate was in December 2011. It was an Ulster Unionist debate. Uh, one of the concerns raised at that stage as well was uh, when our producers were doing away with their cages, they were actually going to other European countries to be used there. Has the Minister any evidence that that actually happened, or has she taken any steps with her European counterparts to try and regulate the, any eggs being produced, are being produced to the European standard? Well, um I can say that in terms of the, the countries that weren't compliant at that stage who may have been wanting these um, cages coming to them, they now are compliant apart from these two countries that have, that have set out. Um, they may have thought that they could, they could do that, that they could just continue with the, the current practice. But obviously the, the threat of um, infraction from Europe made a difference and, and I think that that was because we, all member states were very concerned about the impact this would have on them if, if those people were allowed to continue to trade. So the, the pressure has been applied. We have. Um, success in terms of um, the, the 11, 11 countries all now coming on board. But we do need to keep the pressure on Italy and Germany to make sure that they are also compliant. And I know that um, there is court cases that are, that are ongoing there because of that. I call Dominic Bradley. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And uh, I thank the Minister for her answer. Uh, I, I was tempted to ask her which comes first, the chicken or the egg, but uh, I don't think I'll, I'll give in to that temptation. In any case, can, can I ask the Minister what specific measures she can take to lessen the impact of this measure uh, on the industry here? As I said in my original answer, the, our industry were very keen to make sure they maintain their high reputation for producing and producing to the highest standards of welfare. So I very much commend them for, for doing that. Um, egg producers, like any other um, producers, are able to come forward to the department for quite a range of supports that are there. Process of marketing grant scheme, there's, there's quite a range of supports that are available to egg producers also. So um, th that's open to them, and I know a number have availed of that in the past. As I said, my job was to make sure that we keep putting pressure on the EU to make sure that um, they stop and, and rule out anybody um, trading with, uh, when they're not compliant. I think we've successfully done that to a certain extent. We have a wee bit to go in the other two countries, but um, we're on the road to making sure that we're not disadvantaged in any shape or form because of, of two, con two countries that have decided that they're going to ignore the directive. Moving on, I call Katrina Ruan. Question number five, please. The European Fisheries Fund remains open for applications under Measure 1.3 for financial assistance towards investments um, on board fishing vessels, which includes support uh, towards the cost of modifying vessels to aid navigational safety. No applications for such support have been received to date, but my officials would be happy to discuss what support could be provided under Measure 1.3 of the European Fisheries Fund. I am aware that there have been talks between fishermen and the project promoters on the impact and the, that the development would have on the established mussel fishery, and I believe that a number of mitigation uh, measures were agreed to address the concerns by those that may be affected by the construction, and that was done to everybody's satisfaction. 
I'd like to thank the Minister for her reply there. And so I just would ask, so is the Minister confirming that there is money, potential money available for operational costs if they're being sought? Yes, that, that's, what, that's what I'm confirming. There are, um, as I said, a number of measures under the European Fisheries Fund that can help vessels reduce their fuel costs and generally become more efficient. However, the EFF does not allow for new fishing vessels, but for all the other measures, improving efficiency, um, new propellers, provided that the improvements don't increase their ability to um, increase their catch. But all those other measures are, are certainly eligible for funding. And there's also a grant that's available for the re um, putting new engine, basically, in the, in the vessel. So um, if there are people that uh, the, minister, or the member thinks that um, could avail of this scheme, I would encourage them to, to contact ARD and, and um, to make sure that they avail of, of an assistance that's there for them. And I call Pat Sheehan. Question six. The recent announcement of an outbreak of Clara ash dieback in hedge row um, ash trees in County Leitrim is regrettable, but not unexpected. Experience in Britain and Europe suggests that, um, suggests, tells it that the disease often spreads from recently planted trees to older trees by the release of spores from infected leaves that have fallen to the ground. In line with our joint All Ireland Clara Control Strategy, officials in Damp Forest Service have kept counterparts in Dard and the Forest Service aware of the situation and how they plan to eradicate this outbreak. Our surveillance in the wider countryside, closest to the outbreak in the south, has been increased, but has not yet found any signs of the disease in the native, native older trees and hedgerows. Elsewhere, we have inspected older trees close to the young plantations, which have already been destroyed as part of the control programme. This has been a significant amount of work. This year, by the 16th of October, inspectors had visited 1,066 sites and found 10 new cases of Clara infection. Together with the cases found during 2012, 87 young plantations planted since 2006 have been declared infected, and over 70,000 associated young planted trees and leaf debris um, were destroyed. So the outlook isn't, is not optimistic. Uh, once the disease begins circulating in the wider environment, as has been the case in Leitrim, then control becomes very difficult. Nevertheless, while the disease is limited to only um, one or a few sites, eradication has to be tried, and I'm sure that we in this House wish our colleagues in the South Wales as they try to control the disease that affects every one of us on the island of Ireland. I call Pat Sheehan for supplementary. Uh, I wonder, could the Minister tell us if mature ice trees are destroyed, uh, if they're found to be infected with ice dieback? Um, well, just again to confirm that um, it's hypothetical at this stage, given that um, DARD surveillance has not revealed any disease spread from um, young ash to older trees and hedgerows. That being said, our surveillance um, includes inspection of older trees in the vicinity of young plantations affected by Clara ash dieback, which have already been destroyed. Surveillance in the wider countryside closest to the outbreak in the south has also been increased. And our response to any disease findings are subject to the All Ireland um, Clara Control Strategy. And that states that our policy is to contain and eradicate the disease and minimise the risk of it spreading and becoming established. The strategy also states that it will be adaptable to changing circumstances and will be kept under constant review based on the ongoing surveillance and the development of scientific knowledge of this complex disease. So I think that's very much key that we're able to adapt our policy given um, any uh, I suppose new findings that we have or any new science. Um, it's really important that, um, that we're able to uh, adapt our policy uh, uh, to really as and when is required. I call Patsy McGlone. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers up until now. Could the Minister give us some uh, clarification as to what specific resources have been targeted at tackling the disease, please? Well, obviously, um, in terms of resources, it's been Forest Service. It's very much been to the lead of, of tackling this disease. Um, they have done fantastic work, and they've been very, very busy, particularly whenever you hear the, the number of sites that they've visited and the testing that they have carried forward. I've also, um, in terms of resources, uh, looked at the department and looked at what else we can do in terms of tackling the, these recent tree diseases. So it's obviously we're dealing with ash, with ash we're dealing with P. remorum. You know, there's a range of diseases that, that are... Um, prevalent at this moment in time in our Forest Service land. So DARD, um, we have availed of additional resources within Forest Service because obviously they have specialist skills 
and, and machinery available to them. But also, based on their experience, the Permanent Secretary and I decided to allocate responsibility for all plant health matters um, to the Chief Executive of Forest Service. And that's going to ensure that policy and implementation are um, being led by a senior civil servant with appropriate professional qualification. Recognising the threat of plant disease and pests appears to be increasing, the Department has also then um, indicated that we intend to increase the scale of resources devoted to plant health. So that may well be prioritising within Forest Service um, the areas of work that people are involved with. I call Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers. Minister, a number of landowners in my own constituent, consist, constituency, even in North Antrim, have planted out land using ash, using department grants. They had to then cut back and remove all the trees when ash dieback was actually found. Is there any grant aid that is available from within the department to replant those areas? Yes. Um, you may remember back in June um, of this year, I actually announced grant support for any of those woodland owners that are affected. So basically, if you've had to remove um, trees, what we've done is we've put grant support in place that will help you to replant with alternative species, because obviously we want to continue to be planting trees. This is something that will obviously scare landowners, and they'll obviously be very careful about what they're planting in the future. So what we're doing is um, we've announced grant support that will encourage replanting with um, species that obviously are less susceptible to um, types, these types of disease. Moving on, I call Dolores Kelly. Question 7, please, Mr Deputy Speaker. The dairy sector makes a very important contribution to the local agri-food industry and to ensure its future sustainability. When milk quotas end in 2015, it is vital that it remains competitive. My department aims to help the dairy sector improve its performance and grow its potential in the marketplace in a sustainable way. This has included joint support with InvestNI for an industry-led competitiveness study aimed at helping the sector to plan for the future post-milk quotas. The recommendations of that study are now being taken forward by the dairy industry. I believe that a market-led strategy is vital for the dairy sector because when milk quotas end, there will be no restraints on production. As a consequence, future decisions on milk production will be taken by the dairy sector in context of input, input costs and also market returns. To help ensure that the industry remains sustainable, my department will continue to provide education, training, technical support and research to help improve efficiency, competitiveness and innovation. In addition, we are currently consulting on proposals for a range of measures to support the sustainable development of the local agri-food industry, including the dairy sector, under the 2014 to 2020 Rural Development Programme. The dairy sector has the potential to grow further in a sustainable way, particularly following the end of milk quotas, and to exploit um, opportunities arising from the predicted world population expansion. The Agri-Food Strategy Board's report going for growth, as, um, as I said earlier, set out very challenging targets for the local agri-food industry and recognises the need for all parts of the supply chain to be sustainable and to be profitable. The recommendations in the report are currently being considered, and I hope to bring forward proposals to the Executive in the very near future. I call Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Thank the Minister for her answer. And, uh, she will be well aware of uh, Minister Coveney, our counterpart in the, in the South of Ireland's hands-on approach to strategic issues such as this. So, what discussions, if any, has the Minister had with uh, Minister Coveney in relation to an all-Ireland marketing approach to uh, the dairy industry and to milk produced in the north of Ireland? It's something that we would regularly discuss in terms of um, marketing right across the world, not just in the dairy sector, but for all sectors, at NSMC meetings and at discussions outside of that. I mean, the dairy sector for us is obviously hugely, hugely important, given that it accounts for something like 32% of our entire agricultural output. So, and we also have employment on 3,500 farms, 2,200 people are employed in processing, £850 million of sales. That's an industry that we need to protect. I have already outlined in the answer, I don't know what else the, the member is looking for, but I've outlined in the original answer um, the work that we have done, particularly around the competitiveness study. That's what dairy industry asked for, that's what I provided. We've also done a lot of work around the EU milk package and making sure that is um, relevant to our local industry. Post milk quotas, this is the issue that um, I think that is going to, I suppose, in some senses provide a challenge to the industry, but it's something that the industry have been very aware is coming for quite a long period of time. It's something that the industry have been planning for post-2015. Um, We've seen expansion in our dairy sector since 1995. I believe that will continue. I don't necessarily believe that quotas are necessarily the dictator of prices. Whenever they were introduced um, quite a number of years ago, it was around really preventing Europe having to pay excessive um, funds for, for intervention. I don't believe that, um, that that's, that's needed anymore. I think that um, when we're looking to the future, we need to plan our, our, for, for the target growth. 
We have very real targets for the dairy sector. You can see that in the agri-food strategy report. So that's as hands-on as I can get in terms of working with the dairy sector and making sure that we are there for meeting the challenges that um, we have brought forward this major piece of work in the agri-food strategy board to the executive. That's all very positive and, and, and work in progress in, in terms of the, the time ahead. I don't believe that we need to be competing with the South. I believe that we should very much be focused on the export-led growth, which is at the core of the um, Going for Growth document. If we very much focus on that, on marketing what we have, which is a very strong brand image, clean green image of what we produce here. So that's the strength we build on. We don't need to fight about um, where, where milk's going. I think that we work together, we brand and we market, and we get into those markets that, that we're trying to, to reach, particularly given the population rise. The Minister's time. Let's go. <laughs> And that is the end of questions to the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development.